I would like to begin by uh, thanking uh, Ajay and uh, Amita Desai for uh, this invitation to uh, have a book discussion uh, around violence studies. Um, and I think that for us, uh, as authors, uh, it is an extremely valuable opportunity to be able to talk to Manthanites about this volume, uh, particularly because of the kind of uh, public forum and uh, the space for debate uh, that Manthan offers. Uh, I think that a theme uh, like violence, which is the core theme around which this book is structured, uh, is something uh, that needs uh, an urgent deliberation by this forum and beyond. And I hope that today's, uh, th this evening's uh, deliberations will actually just signal uh, a, a much longer uh, and sustained debate uh, on this question. Uh, I'm happy, uh, even before I start, I must say I'm happy that we have four authors of this uh, volume with us today. Uh, we have V. Gita, a very well-known writer, translator, feminist activist from Chennai, uh, who has written prolifically in Tamil and English on questions of literature, culture, caste, anti-caste philosophies, discrimination, and feminist theory. We have Professor Abdul Shaban, who is currently the deputy director of uh, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Tuljapur, and a professor of Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai, who has done some of the most stunning work that I have ever read on the question of minority rights in relation to the Constitution, in relation to criminal justice systems, in relation to equal opportunities, and in relation to the everyday lives of Muslims in this country. Abdul Shaban is also a member of several policy bodies, including the Equal Opportunities Commission. And both of them are public intellectuals who have constantly engaged on questions of rights and discrimination of vulnerable and marginalized communities in the country. Our fourth author, who is also in the audience with us, and we are proud to have him here with us, is Shumanto Banerjee, veteran journalist, civil libertarian, and Shumanto really needs no uh, introduction to this uh, audience. And, and all, Shumanto Banerjee, Vigita, and Abdul Shaban are uh, contributors to this volume, along with several other very eminent contributors uh, that the volume can boast of, like David Arnold, uh, Jaiti Ghosh, and several others who might certainly be familiar to this audience. Uh, basically, what I felt we could do uh, with this evening uh, is not to restrict the discussion that we have today uh, to this volume alone, because uh, for us, as uh, people who have worked on this volume over a period of almost three to four years, uh, this volume brings together some serious thinking, attempts to theorize, and attempts to understand our complex realities today. Where does the genesis of the problem lie? Is it a single problem? Uh, is it a problem that is episodic? Is it systemic? Is it embedded in structure? And where does the resolution to it lie? So if we are talking of a route out of violence, if we are talking about a route to peace, how do we actually pick our way through this abyss to reach that point of peace or restoration? And in, in a sense, it was this very, um, uh, you know, the very troubling realities of violence that we confront every day that was a trigger for this volume. It was also part of a larger exercise where we believe that 
the, the, uh, but that higher education, particularly in the social sciences and humanities, uh, needs to uh, be subjected to a serious rethinking. We need to be able to cross disciplinary boundaries and we need to be able to think and write and deliberate across disciplines because it's no longer enough for us to think of sociology, history, political science, economics and be caught in the boundaries of those disciplines because our realities are extremely complex and in fact are forcing us every day to think beyond these boundaries. And so we felt that it is useful to think about a field and Oxford University Press has actually come out with a series of volumes of interdisciplinary uh, areas like media studies and sexuality studies and minority studies for instance. But we thought that violence studies is an area in which there is actually no writing. We have some writing from other countries. We have Zizek, we have Hannah Arendt, we have people from outside, Selvia Wolby, who have actually written uh, monographs or theoretical works on violence. But what actually struck us was that when we look at India, we, don't, we have people writing on violence as part of several other contexts that they are looking at. But there isn't a single place where we have attempted to understand violence in all its facets and to attempt to theorize it. And this was one such attempt that we made. Um, and till it all came together, we didn't actually know that it even would come together because it is such a disparate and spread out field. For me, as, uh, as the editor, there were a few questions that uh, I started out with. The first question was, is violence an exception? Is it really extraordinary? Are violence and civilization necessarily opposed categories? Or is violence constitutive of civilization? Is violence part of civilization and modernity itself? And how might we actually recognize violence? Is violence always stated, visible, um, agreed upon through a broad consensus? Or are there some acts of violence that are read down and not treated as violence? The most obvious example, of course, that comes to mind uh, based also on my experience in working uh, for a very long time with women is the question of marital rape, which is violence, but in the law and in social discourse is really not even constructed as violence. Oddly enough, domestic violence and wife battery is violence, but marital rape is not violence in Indian society. And so there are many of these kinds of instances that we can come up with. Who are the victims of violence? And who do we recognize? And when, we, when I say we, who is the we? So how, how is the community of the we constituted? Now increasingly we hear the opposition between national and anti-national. My question is to go even further below that level. Who is the we? How is violence constitutive of caste orders? not in terms of large conflagrations, not in terms of large massacres, but in the everyday, through micro practices of discrimination, through micro practices of untouchability, through micro practices of exclusion. How do we constitute violence in the everyday lived realities of caste? How do we constitute violence in terms of community and belonging? We see a very strange but familiar phenomenon before us today. In the entire discourse on beef, we find that the two sets of people who are targeted by violence 
are Muslims and Dalits. But this is not an unusual or unexpected or a uh, or new uh, conflation that is happening. If you look at debates during partition, and one part of this book has actually looked in great detail at partition dialogues and partition debates and the histories of partition. What you find very clearly is narratives by Hindu men during Sikh men who suffered partition, who say we know why partition was necessary. Because at the time that we were together, we were always cautioned not to take food from Muslims, not to eat in Muslims' homes, not to touch tiffin boxes of our friends in school. And we were made to have a bath when we came back home from Muslim homes. And so Bir Bahadur Singh during partition, who, 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 who lived through partition says, when I think of it now as a Sikh man who has gone through 1984, I really wonder why did we not expect that partition would happen? Because we were already at the time of partition a divided society. So there are very, very moving narratives that come out through the historiography of that time. We also have, for instance, the, uh, you know, the statement by Jasimuddin, who is this poet in Bengal, who was a regular and a putative son of the filmmaker Rinal Sen's mother. And he was a constant visitor in Rinal Sen's house and always treated as a son. And so Rinal Sen's mother asks him, after all, you are also our son, and we are all sons and mothers and brothers and sisters, so why do you want partition? And he turned to Rinal Sen's mother and says, if I was your son, why do your sons sit inside the kitchen and eat, and I sit outside the kitchen in your house? And why do you always give me a separate plate from the plates your son eat, son's eaten? If I was a son, why am, not, why, why am I not a son like the others? And so we begin to understand what the everyday experience of violence is. How is the everyday experience of violence tied to humiliation? at the everyday level and what does that then happen what, what happens then how does that cumulative violence then open out into large episodes that we are suddenly shocked with need we be shocked at the large episodes or is there need and this is the primary question that i think we need to ask today is there need for a self reflexivity on our part on every one of our parts in thinking through the question of violence and how we move beyond this violence to another place. We, of course, pride ourselves on being the home to nonviolence. We own Gandhi and say this creed of nonviolence is what India is based on. But it was not only Gandhi's creed. As Gita's work will show, and her essay in, in this uh, volume shows, if you look at anti-caste philosophers, whether it is Ayodhya Das or Phule or Ambedkar, you will find, Periyar, you will find that they were all opposed to the humiliation, to the discrimination, and to the horrendous forms, the macabre forms of violence that caste engendered. But in all of their writing, what you see is an ethical anger and never a call to violence as retribution. It is to a place that will take us away from this violence, but certainly not into the lap of violence. And so I'm shocked when I read a report in the Hindu today, and I will close with this, I am shocked when I read a report in the Hindu a few days ago 
that uh, in 2011 there was an incident of uh, Indian soldiers being killed and beheaded by Pakistani soldiers. And as a retaliation, Operation Ginger then took a small contingent of Indian soldiers across the border to kill Pakistani soldiers. All is fair in war. You, you Indian soldiers get killed, Pakistani soldiers get killed. War, war, killing is central to war. War would have no meaning without the loss of life. But we have the Geneva Convention in place and the mutilation of the dead is a war crime. In areas of hostility, during hostility, if somebody loses their life, the mutilation of a dead body is a war crime, which can be prosecuted under international law. And we have a completely unproblematic report in our national newspaper that even names the officer and interviews him and quotes the interview as saying, I led an expedition which mutilated a dead enemy. So I think it is time really for us to wake up. These are times of war. These are times of violence. But violence for women has been every day. It has been there right from, especially for girls, right from the time that you are able to walk out on your own, age five you are warned that you may be groped or assaulted on the street. So violence is everyday for women. And our coping mechanisms also deal with everyday violence. But we are also coming up with extremely gruesome forms of violence. And being defensive or uncritical or unreflexive about this violence will not take us anywhere. And so we felt that the primary reason why we need to visit this is because we need to better understand how we are to think through violence and we have a really committed and um, uh, you know a wonderful group of scholars who came together to think through the question of violence more with a view to trying to understand what lies beyond? What about our futures? And what about the futures of the generations that come after us? What is it that we will bequeath to them? With these few words, I would like uh, to invite Gita to speak. Thanks, Kalpana, for inviting me to be part of this evening's panel, and thanks to Manthan for organizing this event. Um, I'd like to start with a reference to a book that many of us might have read in our childhood, Mark Twain's Huckleberry Finn. Um, in Huckleberry Finn, his aunt asks him, after he's come home after a particularly adventurous expedition somewhere, and she says, you know, that's very dangerous. People could have got killed was anyone in danger of losing their lives or did anyone get killed? To which Huck Finn replies, no, 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 not, not too many people were there. In any case, no person got killed, only some Negroes. So in a sense, when we speak of violence, um, we also have to think of the various stages that precede the act of violence. And in some cases, Violence follows after a series of negations, after we have consistently negated the right of a group of people, a particular gender, and consigned them to the realm of non-existence, that they don't matter as human beings, so that their killing can never be a cause for concern. So I think that aspect of violence is something that um, is central to many of the gruesome acts that we witness all around us, both in the Indian context and in the kinds of wars that are being waged today, particularly in, in, in parts of West Asia and in parts of Africa, where for various reasons, several categories of people are consigned to the status of being non-persons. 
and as kalpana pointed out for women this is a very familiar reality because to be hurt to be punished simply on account of being of a certain sex or gender is an experience that many of us here will relate to for various reasons so this consigning of a person or a group of persons to the realm of non existence is something that i'd like for us to keep in mind when we come to address issues of violence that's on the one hand on the other hand you have the other the almost the extreme opposite of 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 what i've just said where violence is also attendant on expressions of love um in tamil nadu for example over the last 3 months we've seen eight murders of women mostly in the age group 18 to 25 all of whom have been killed by those who claim to love them these murders happened in a range of public spaces in a railway station in a church in a, a college classroom in the bazaar um in someone's house which is open to the street so you have this very strange paradox where you kill because you love and where you kill because you don't think someone is quite human and in between these two polar states you have a range of human acts of violence which combine both these emotions of what we imagine to be love or what we imagine to be indifference hatred and so on now what i am concerned with and this is what actually prompted me to write about dr ambedkar in this volume is how do you understand the acts of those who cause violence who commission violence or carry them out because many of us find it easy to speak of the victims of violence um we feel sorry for them we feel enraged we feel righteous indignation we call upon the law and justice systems to do their best by the victims but it's not often that we spend time thinking about the perpetrator of violence Now, who is this person who causes this act gruesome maybe not so gruesome um, maybe carried out in a fit of anger or carried out systematically through desperate means or ruthlessly completely planned and so on so for me reading dr ambedkar help me unpack the notion of the person that carries out acts of violence for the simple reason and why why i think dr ambedkar's writings are useful in this context is um his indictment of the society that he was born into of what he calls the hindu social order is very very fundamental to much of his writing and what is that indictment that indictment is that in this social order it is not possible for any of us to be fully and fulsomely human that we all participate in the hindu social and caste order as people with a greater or a lesser sense of impaired selfhood of impaired personhood you cannot be a full human being in the social order and he used the notion of graded inequality the term that he coined to describe how people relate to each other and relate to themselves so your sense of self is not dependent on what you feel from within you or what you experience in a moment of knowledge or bliss or ecstasy or affection or love but what you experience in terms of who you can denigrate and who you can look up to and has he famously said in the hindu caste system as you go higher up the caste ladder you experience reverence and respect as you come down you are humiliated and you experience resentment so in this social order no one can be a person in the sense that philosophy defines personhood or psychology defines personhood you're always already impaired in some ways so i want to sort of keep that definition in mind and ask some questions about the kinds of violence we see around us and how may we understand those that carry out these acts of violence i'm not going to look at what are dramatic spectacular acts of violence such as those carried out by the indian armed forces in kashmir or in the northeast um or th- those that we witness in 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 uh, bastar in chatisgarh um these are acts of political violence that may be spoken of even though the indian state may not like what we have to say about those acts of violence but there are any number of quotidian acts everyday acts that are not easy to speak of and i'm just going to index some of these for you one is of course what kalpana already referred to the everyday violence of the caste order 
And here I'm not even thinking of gruesome acts of imposed untouchability. I'm just thinking of something as everyday as speech. So um, a human rights group in Tamil Nadu studied a bunch of first information reports generated in eight southern districts of the state. Um, these information reports were based on cases filed under the Prevention of Atrocities Against Scheduled Castes and Scheduled Tribes Act 1989. And they picked out those FIRs which referred to verbal abuse, not physical abuse, not active acts of violence, but verbal abuse. And they listed the kinds of everyday speech that Dalits are subject to. Um, and the phrases that are often used to describe Dalit men or Dalit women have a reference to their sexual organs, have a reference to their sexual orientation. So Dalit men are often referred to as faggots in the sense that they're not complete men. Dalit women are often referred to in terms of their vaginas, which are characterized as dirty and demeaning and so on. Um, Dalit men are constantly seen as uh, on the prowl, looking out to seduce non-Dalit women. Dalit women are seen as um, sexually available to non-Dalit men. And these are all in the course of everyday exchanges, not because I have something particular to pick with someone else as a Dalit or a non-Dalit, but just the way in which you are addressed and framed as a human person in a particular context is in these terms. So we are talking of a kind of violence where the self itself is constructed in a certain way. And these would not count for violence in our society if we did not have the 1989 Atrocities Act or the PCR Act that was um, um, uh, created in the 1950s. So basically, it's civil rights discourse and the discourse of law which has created the possibility of us identifying the everyday life of caste as a deeply criminal existence. And so that's on the one hand. The second set of acts that I want to draw attention to is something that um, is as much part of our everyday and which has to do with how um, we resolve issues that emerge in the realm of human intimacy, whether this has to do with marriage, whether this has to do with sexual relationships, whether this has to do with intense human relationships. Now, this, of course, is subject to change over historical, over historical periods and historical context. And what I find over the last 10 years, and I've been sort of collecting these news cuttings for the last 10 years, is a number of everyday acts of murder is carried out in the realm of impaired conjugality. Adultery is one of the main contexts in which murders happen. So I want us to keep that in mind. And I was asking Kalpana when we, as we drove here, is that the same in Andhra or is it something to do with the way the Tamil press reports these things? I'm not quite sure how to read this information, but a fair amount of deaths happen on an everyday basis in the realm of intimate human relationships. And this is not of the kind that feminists are familiar with, which has to do with things like marital rape, which has to do with domestic violence, dowry-related violence, familial violence, and so on, but which has to do with how we relate to each other in our most intimate everyday lives. So that's a second level of violence. A third level, which I see as something that is all around us again in a very fundamental sense are the kind of everyday deaths to do with what I may call our political and economic lives. Whether this, is, this has to do with the killing of a, um, of a sincere, responsible civil servant who's caught on to sand mining in a certain context, whether this has to do with real estate related crimes, whether this has to do with recruiting workers and bringing them to a certain city, and then the inability to marshal these workers into any kind of a disciplinary formation, which leads to different kinds of violence. So you have a violence emerging out of the moment in which we live now, uh, a, a, a time of, of unprecedented predatory capital mobilization, dispossession of the poor, large-scale migration, people being concentrated in urban conglomerates, and the kind of everyday violence that this, that this breeds, and which is only capturable again within the terms of the Indian Penal Code. So I sort of lay out this map in front of you, not to sort of make us all feel aghast and upset, but just to point to the fact that we seem to be living in a context where everyday acts of violence, such as those that take place in caste society, are systemic and belong to the long durée of history. As 
do gender crimes and then you have specific contextual historical acts not that adultery didn't exist before or political and economic crimes didn't exist before but they appear to be accentuated in a certain way in our present so i want to try and ask questions about how do we understand those who commission these acts of violence or who carry out these acts of violence whether in terms of the longer history of the caste order or in terms of the intersecting history of the present and the past and not that i have any answers to these questions but i just want to raise some issues and here i want to look at two things that um, dr ambedkar sort of constantly called attention to one is that the possibility of a life free of violence can only exist if we do not consistently oppose inequality now what stops us from consistently opposing inequality and according to dr ambedkar in the caste context inequality is built into the very structure and fabric of our lives and secondly inequality as creed is central to hinduism itself now you can quarrel with that argument if you like but we may find it harder to quarrel with how he understands the continuous manufacture of arguments which legitimize inequality and he looks at the different ways in which the primary intellectual class of this country which until recently at least comprised largely brahmin intellectuals have time and again justified inequality time and again updated their reasons for justifying inequality and he does this very well especially in his essay on the gita his marvelous essay in, in riddles in hinduism called krishna and his gita where he basically talks about how inequality is sanctioned in a way that it is not sanctioned in the vedas it is not sanctioned in sankhya philosophy it is sanctioned precisely at a moment when the brahmanical social order has come into crisis because of buddhism and then you have the interpretative efforts of brahman intellectuals to shore up the caste order now again in historical terms this picture could be complicated i'm sure but what's important to note is how do we time and again manufacture consent for inequality in our context so that with all the elaborate legal mechanisms that we have for promoting equality inequality still finds widespread consensus inequality finds consensus through any number of means whether it is opposition to the reservation policy whether it is opposition to counting marital rape as a crime whether it is sort of trying to counter cases filed under the atrocities act by filing what the police call counter cases basically establishing an equivalence between the violence of dominant caste with the kinds of possible violence that dalits may or may not have carried out so through any number of means we seem to be creating perpetual situations of inequality and that calls for deep reflection as a people how are we complicit with this consensus that is created time and again how do we sort of engage with this complicity we may not all be directly involved or directly complicit in this act but how do we then mark our position and i'm reminded here of what the late civil liberties activist ram narayan kumar wrote about the punjab in the context of all the disappearances that took place in the 80s especially the discovery of mass graves and he wrote this very very important book about um, about um, the several thousands of young men who were disappeared and murdered called reduced to ashes and there he points out how were these decisions made to kill these men these were not policy decisions there exists no written directives but people knew about these killings members of parliament knew about these killings judges who claim that such murders never took place knew about these killings the media knew about these killings neighbors knew about it but everybody kept quiet some people in the good faith that it was a patriotic act to keep quiet some people because they had something to gain by keeping quiet others because they were coerced into keeping quiet and he lists out a number of reasons but fundamentally what he's pointing to and what he says so so well in that book is that before there can be legal acknowledgement that an atrocity or a crime has taken place there must be social acknowledgement of a crime and he says in the indian context such social acknowledgement is simply not forthcoming when it comes to crimes in the punjab in nagaland or in kashmir now that is at the level of crimes which are recognized at least in the civil liberties tradition as crimes but what about crimes of caste what about crimes of gender which until lately were not seen as crimes at all even though we have laws which prohibit both crimes both kinds of crimes 
and the late K. Balagopal, who was from this city, in fact said, wrote in one of his essays, how we would end up with a very different genealogy of human rights if you start with caste crimes. Such a genealogy would not just refer to the violence that we suffer at the hands of the Indian state, but also the violence that is endemic to civil society. So these are things that makes us think of our own role in sort of allowing a situation of everyday, to use an American word, low intensity, fateful conflict to continue, which erupts into uh, horrible acts of violence from time to time. So that's at, that's at one level. The other question that I wish to sort of raise is, how do we then understand this, this sense of our complicity? Um, and here we can take, you know, Kalpana pointed out that there has been theorization of violence in different parts of the world, and she pointed to many examples of people who've done that. But I think in all those theorizations, whether it's Franz Fanon talking about anti-colonial violence in, um, in, in, in um, Algeria, whether it is um, acts of violence carried out by political torturers in Argentina or in Chile, whether it's acts of violence in uh, Nazi Germany, all of those theories which talk about such acts of violence step back from the actual act of violence and provide us with a normative, political and historical framework within which such acts were made meaningful for the perpetrators. And one can debate endlessly whether that was indeed the case, whether we should agree with Hannah Arendt that um, all those that uh, were in charge of gas chambers were merely following laws, what she calls the banality of violence, or will we um, go with um, someone like Don Daniel Goldhagen said that it had something to do with the German personality itself, and so on. Now, those are debatable issues, but what is not debatable is that the perpetrator must be placed at the center of these acts of violence, and we need to ask important searching questions about those perpetrators, something which we have barely begun to do in the Indian context. Because we find it easy to talk about victims, but we don't find it easy to talk about ourselves. And as Balgopal again put it so memorably, because for example, with respect to caste, to be against caste is also to be at least a little bit against oneself. Because we all benefit from being part of this caste order in greater or lesser measure, or we suffer in greater or lesser measure for being part of this order. So I think there's something there that calls for reflection. And if we were to look for other kinds of context from where we can begin to think of some of these things, what about theories of impaired personhood in the Indian context? And we have a very interesting modern genealogy to this. After all, if you take a book like Hinswaraj, Gandhi's Hinswaraj, you see that it sort of posits the laws of a certain way of being on account of colonialism. Again, subject to historical critical scrutiny, but basically Gandhi is arguing for a different sense of self, um, just as Fanon was arguing for a different sense of self in Algeria. Um, then again, when you come to the anti-caste movements, whether it is, as Kalpana said again, Ayotitas or Fule or Dr. Ambedkar or Periyar, you find that they start with the fact of an impaired personhood. And it's not accidental that all of them try to reconstruct this personhood both at the level of the individual self and at the level of the collective self. So the level of the collective self, you would have Periyar sort of speak of the importance of constituting comradeship that you have to have a widespread notion of comradeship, which is not based on kinship, which is not based on caste, which is not based on gender hierarchy. And you would see Dr. Ambedkar sort of signal out fraternity as the most important of the three political virtues bequeathed to us by the French Revolution. And how both equality and liberty must be necessarily attendant on fraternity. So you need a new sense of relationships, social relationships to emerge, just as you need a new sense of the self. And Dr. Ambedkar starts with the um, sort of stating of the claims of fraternity as an ideal, but when finally he converts to Buddhism in 1956, you have him sort of talk of the importance of reinventing your own self, not just in the sense of forming a new collective, which after all, and as he was very aware, was offered by socialism. You can have a new sense of the collective human person, uh, which was available in the early 20th century. And for those of us who did not know of the crimes of Joseph Stalin's Russia, it did seem an achievable ideal in the 30s and 40s. 
So there was that sense of a new collectivity which Ambedkar also trusted and which he felt was central to modern existence. But he was not sanguine that would produce a new ethical self, especially as ethical self that was necessary to counter the caste order, which is why he sort of makes his ultimate move to opt out of what he felt was a creed of inequality and to embrace Buddhism. And I want to sort of end with his very memorable words, um, in, uh, among many other memorable words in that book, The Buddha and His Dhamma, where he sort of lists all the qualities that you're familiar with if you read the Buddhist canon, which is Karuna, Maitri, Krodha, and so on. And then he sort of makes a case for Maitri, or what he calls social fellowship. And he says, but greater than Karuna is Maitri, because Maitri is not simply affection, it is not simply individual love, it is not sentiment, it is not uh, condescend condescending pity. Maitri is more than compassion, it is a sense of social fellowship that includes not just human beings, but all of the created world. And at the center of that, of course, is the case he makes for social compassion. Whereas from 1919, till almost the days of the Constituent Assembly, he was very clear that you can achieve a measure of social responsibility and social ownership of equality through legal means, through forms of representation where Dalits are represented in adequate measure. By the time he writes the Buddha and his Dhamma, you see him sort of recalling an earlier phrase of his, which I think he sort of has recourse to in the 1920s, where he says, um, people might ask me what the law and what government can do with regard to inequality. You cannot legislate social affection, I quote him. You cannot legislate social affection, but little short of that, you can create conditions which criminalizes inequality. Now, in 1956, he returns to that question and he talks of the need for cultivating social affection, both in terms of a new comradeship of, of people who come into a new sense of the self and in terms of deliberate acts of self-cultivation. And I think if we are to sort of talk about violence today, we need to ask ourselves, what are these forms of self-cultivation that are not available to us? What are these forms of comradeship that have broken down? Because it seems as if between those who feel offended, between those who feel, who resist something, those who are desperate, those who are criminally inclined, between the thought and the act, there is nothing that seems to mediate it. Of course, we know specific things mediate specific crimes, but in a more fundamental, ethical and philosophical sense, it's as if we have lost the ability to converse together as a society, to create public spaces where such con conversation is possible, to disagree with some measure of decorum, to not want to take a knife to something that I don't like, not want to spout hatred with a point of view, I disagree. Somewhere, some of these things have broken down. And I think this breaking down has happened over a long period of time. And to recreate some of those protocols of living together, we need to start by asking very fundamental questions about what does it mean to live together? And how am I going to inhabit this shared space of comradeship? What is my call out to my fellow human being and from what position of ethical or political responsibility am I going to do this calling out? Thank you. Thank you, Geeta. I would like to now invite Abdul Shaban to speak. Very good evening to all of you and uh, I'm very thankful to the organizers that uh, they gave me a chance to interact with you and uh, let me also share with you that uh, maybe this is uh, one of the few important public forum where we are sharing the pains or actually the thoughts, the how the society really is entering into violence and actually circuit of violence. So what I will do uh, uh, in this that obviously the book is in front of me and uh, 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 in my thought that uh, we read many books uh, on actually the violence. But here is a kind of attempt by hmm, Dr. Kalpana to create a volume which really covers the all, I mean, dimensions of the violence. It is not, she is not talking about the violence, only like riots are actually the caste violence, but actually trying to cover that how the society 
at large actually facing different kind of violence, whether it is a symbolic violence, it is a structural violence, whether it is a physical violence. So that is very important. But while talking to this kind of uh, violence, I mean, it's a very difficult time for the scholars, are very difficult time. I said, I tell you that, uh, I mean, some of you are very brave persons who have taken this initiative to talk on the violence. Hmm? Nowadays, in the classrooms where we go, it is such a difficult to talk or take a position or tell the students that the violence is taking place on somebody and somebody because they are already coming with a kind of different center of mind. So you have to negotiate those things. And what I say largely, the spaces to talk on the violence is declining. And it will be difficult maybe because of this generation goes out. I don't know whether if we are not able to bring people together, young generation, whether anybody will talk on that issue. Only those who are affected, those who are affected, they cry silently and sometimes even they don't have courage to come and relate their pains in front of the public art. Because even if there is an attempt, there is a gagging from the state. That is also, and in this kind of democracy, jamhuriyat jo hamari hai, usme agar is tarah ka system chal hai, to that is actually most unfortunate. Hmm? We want it to be a, a kind of democracy where everybody voices are heard. So having said this, what I felt that, I mean, Violence has become an integral part of our life and it does not make sense to us till it is not happening to us. Only a few realize, till it is happening to others, it is alright, we can enjoy, but when it happens to us, then actually we are in pain. Then we start talking about when the, this is happening to others, it is alright. So this is what actually we have uh, I mean, come to. Another very important thing that what this society, particularly, I mean, I'm talking about the Indian context. Rosa Luxemburg said once that the capital, the capitalism always creates it outside hmm? because it will create its outside. What I say, the Indian society, dominated by the caste system, irrespective of the religion is trying to create and adopt everybody on the periphery. It does not include in the core. So the equality is actually a subject which never comes to the peripheralized persons or those who are at the margin. And when I am talking about, I am also talking about the religious minorities. And that is where I say, uh, uh, Dr. Kalpana was quoting from Bir Bahadur Singh's writing. And that when he says that how the Muslims are getting Dalitized, I mean, how the Muslims are being forced to become another Dalit through the social practices are the symbols which are very particular to the caste system, which actually perhaps the Muslim not actually falling into. And this is still going on, that, that actually that symbolic violence or that kind of practices which actually create that outside that is going on. So, what I say, the, not only the violence in this society and in this, I mean, uh, as such in the society, it is not only patterned, it flows along the various order, but it also sometimes randomly approaches to somebody. So, it is also actually that, that, that important feature it has. And what we were expecting, that when the modern states emerge, I mean, that is where the book debates about, and actually the, the, I, what I find, the book talks about both the issues. And that is where the beauty of the book lies. It talks on not only the surface issue of it, surface issue of it, like for example, how riots are taking place, I, I try to empirically show it. But it talks about, it gives you also the philosophical foundation of it. It tries to reason it out why it is giving. So the charm of the book emerges that it engages not only with the theory, not with the reasoned out a kind of a speculative argument, but also comes to the empirical realities, what it is going on, wh why it is going on, and that becomes be more most important part of that. And it not only covers, what I say, 
because this is an integral part what I'm going to talk that uh, I mean dimensions I'm going to tell that whether it is colonial in the past historical consequences of the violence whether it is related to the gender aspect whether, whether it is related to the caste aspect whether it is related to the religious aspect and uh, I mean whether it is related to the internal part for example I mean sometimes accession to the state whether the Nizam's rule how it was accessed how the women braved against the certain group of people Razakars but simultaneously there is other history which actually I came to know when I came to Osmanabad that how many were people were buried like particularly Muslims and still they are telling me that sir come and record the people who are still alive that how many were there they could not travel back from Usmanabad to Hyderabad because in the where the police action what they were told be, 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 I was not knowing those histories and still I think that most of us are not knowing but in the villages there are histories there are actually those kind of uh, things are lying so there are actually th th those kind of dimensions particularly what I, uh, I mean uh, I mean I said about the book that obviously as you may have seen the book talks about the I mean it consists of the 14 chapters and it has four dimensions I mean four sections it beautifully it has arranged it talks about the how the violence is associated with the body politics how with the rules and uh, uh, rulers and the first sections beautifully brings largely the colonial and uh, violence hmm? and talks about that how the rules and various uh, politics is associated associated with the violence second what dr kalpana herself has talked about gender gender very important dimensions the book beautifully brings out and third most important is the dalit dalit question dalit questions are raised which gita talked about very important and then it comes to the very important sections which actually i would like to emphasize and you must read that the book talks about also the impunity greed most important part that if a state was to rationalize the violence monopolize the violence even i say that yes modern state has to monopolize the violence because it has to treat sometime that way but it has to rationalize the violence violence cannot be used everywhere but how neither monopolization has been possible in Indian state neither rationalization of the violence has been possible so what actually is there it is very random and still in the violence is rooted in the modern state in a very feudalistic and traditional kind of structures modern state is there but the violence is actually emerging from the traditions uh, traditions what I mean the caste systems what actually is traditional structures the religious anti huh? uh, I mean a kind of strife so that is actually that contradiction Indian state is still carries on and that forms the impunity grid if you belong to a majority community I mean I am talking about wheresoever the minorities are there in Pakistan there may be Hindus here may be Muslims Dalits are I mean on the genders whosoever is weaker the might is right that actually has emerged it is traditional I mean it's not not related to the modernity not that the constitutional governance how come Indian state could not get modernized hmm? that is another question and that remains uh, I mean I, and you see everywhere every time there is a threat to somebody and particularly when I'm coming to this I'm coming a bit bit kind of concerns about what is going to be happen uh, I mean I mean what going to happen and particularly not to romanticize or dramatize it but as a academician what I feel what is I mean uh, this question I asked to many Muslims and particularly what future Muslim as a community hold in this country I am asking this I mean very very blunt question and seeking this uh, I mean reply um, from everyone I mean even even I do and I, and go and ask from the Muslims and non-Muslim I tell that tell them that there is there any assurance for that 
that there will be not any kind of violence. It may be in Hyderabad the situation is different, but I come from the Awadh region of Lucknow, where it was very famous for the religious harmony, syncretic culture, and other thing. But after coming to Maharashtra, I realized that whatsoever the ideas of harmony and syncretism I had, it gets break down when I go to the reality. Hmm? So this is the question. And I tell you that in my research, I asked this question to some Muslim youth in Mumbai, Nagpada, I mean, uh, Dongri area. And when you ask them, I mean, just try to excavate, try to just put your finger on those nerves, some of them break down and they say that what actually I have future because we don't know whether we will get job, whether we will not call, we will, we will not be called Pakistanis and whether we will be assimilated in the developmental process. Because this is the question which is coming, which is coming. And this is very important question for the minorities. But how does actually this, this kind of problem start emerging? What, what, what is the root cause of that? And obviously, root is rooted for the particularly the Hindu-Muslim violence in the colonial history. The way we approach to the history, the way the, the, way the British tried to use the Hindus and Muslims, and then the, the way the educated Hindus and Muslims started using each other and fighting with each other. So th th those are the, uh, uh, th those, those kind of context. And the partition becomes a live wire. Partition and Indians are very, otherwise they, they forget everything. But two, three things they don't forget, they live always in history. One is the partition, another is the caste, third is the gender. They don't, par they, they don't forget it. And partition they don't forget, particularly when you comes to the Muslim question. And they will tell, still will tell, and that is why Gyan Pandey goes to ask those kind of question, can a Muslim can be an Indian? Hmm? Those kind of question he asks, and very blunt question he asks. And then he replies that how actually the whole in the constitutional, uh, I mean the constituent assembly debate, he brings it, how uh, Sardar Patel's idea he brings out that Sardar Patel asks that at the partition time, Muslim not only have to, I mean, mere showing of the loyalty or support to India will not be sufficient for the Muslims. That is the kind of question he was asking. And this is reported, it is in the archives. Those are the question, difficult questions. I mean, th those were asked. So what actually was happening? And that since then it has been the stigmatization of Muslims' identity. I once asked, I mean, I'm, I'm very, I mean, that, that way, I'm very blunt sometimes. Hmm? And I asked to my nana, I went back when I heard this story, that tell me that you have not gone to Pakistan. You tell me, because we would have finished it. I should have not heard this story from the where I'm going to interview. Why you have not gone? And the story is, and he told me that, beta, Hindustan, Pakistan, kya? This is the real story. Or may I say that if you tribal people who are living in the country, if you ask them who are living in the country, they will not be able to tell you. And that was the time in 1947, when there was no newspaper. When there was no newspaper going to that, no information was going there. So those were the innocent people. And second thing, what I debate which actually can be debated on those level that whether the Muslim provided a consensus or a common Hindu provided a kind of argument or consensus, a kind of idea that country can be divided. Who divided the country? Those who, are di who, who divided the country, in fact, they are fighting back to the rest of them. So that is, that is also a question. But what I come to uh, a very important part, because in this volume what I try to put, that how Muslim identity, basically I try to focus on that. Uh, how, what is the, I mean, Muslim questions I started investigating, that how it is linked to violence. And I found that the Muslim questions are particularly 
they are all whatsoever types of violence they are going all major kind of violence whether it is a symbolic whether it is structural and whether it is physical the examples of the physical violence is that you can have riots at will hmm? you can create riot with impunity what i was talking about the the grid and you can be saved the state machinery the modern state will not act against you which is called a democratic state i mean modern democratic state with a constitutional democracy because you come from certain group of people whether it is in hyderabad i am telling you i am not talking about wherever you are dominant whosoever is dominant but there is a pattern in this also whether it is muzaffarnagar whether it is gujarat whether it is a meerat 84 87 89 or it is bhagalpur or it is mumbai 92 93 you you look at the pattern what actually who is punished for that is anybody punished thousands of people's life were destroyed and particularly a weaker community people so where is the justice of emerging where is the justice emerging so that that one one part remains the physical violence second we come to the symbolic violence if you look at the symbolic violence identity particularly stereotyping that are actually putting something like actually some ideas do you surya namaskar in the urdu schools in mumbai hmm? you put it and then you say that how the muslims are struggling they don't know half of them don't know half of them start supporting half of them become they, they become disarrayed like you have thrown something inside a pond and there ripples and they don't know they are confused hmm? and that is that confusion is still in mumbai hmm? where your surya namaskar has been made a, a, a feature and and that is actually and the people say it is a cultural aspect it is not religious aspect but if certain things are related to certain religion and our constitution provides those things particularly uh, from 26 to 30th huh? article 26 to 30th Th this number of things are uh, laid down where the people have freedom for their religion and that is where the diversity has to be maintained and protected so what we see that this symbolic another very important symbolic violence which actually i try to deal with it and the it is then from the symbolic violence to the physical violence to direct one is that many muslim i mean th th this is i am repeating and many times you may have heard but many muslim uh, concentrated areas in cities are called pakistan hmm? that that is that is this a kind of violence against them and i tell you that when from tata institute i used to go i am not a student of anthropology or sociology or political science that i will understand the violence in very uh, nuanced way i come from geography which deals with the sometimes science and other and then i studied in my mphil phd economics i became interested when in the violence and other studies when i came to tata institute of social sciences I start talking about from my colleagues and then i started understanding from the social work approach that how really they are dealing with this kind of and how painful sometime our professors or what kind of pain our professor goes through go through while dealing with those kind of things and th that concern arose so what happened then when you put that idea what i was talking about that you put that it is a pakistan mini pakistan and you go from deonar to uh, dongri then taxi driver tells you sir pakistan chalna hai ha hum bhi chale chalte hain theek hai ek baar do baar suna bar bar repetition usi cheezon ka ho raha hai and what happens this, this symbolic violence often if you take to the reason it out how it ends ultimately what happens that that area has been called as a pakistan and symbolically what you have done you de territorialize the area from the national physical boundary you have thrown out symbolically that this part does not belong to you and then the citizens who are there they also become 
because the hostility on the borders results in hostility on the in, in the local areas and then these become the pakistanis and when they become pa pakistanis then at the appropriate moment when the physical violence is possible then they can be attacked and this is what a symbol and often if you see riots are not fought on the hindu muslim issue nowadays riots are fought or uh, riots are created on the basis of nationalism anti nationalism so the hindu muslim questions is no more B because this symbolic way of deterritorialization stigmatization of the identities has resulted in a kind of uh, uh, i mean a kind of situation where the hindu muslim riots are no more re religious riots but symbolically they have turned out to be a kind of india pakistan fight within the country so you you deeply think about it that how what kind of situation and once you locate that it is a national enemy then you will not have any mercy on him and that is where muslims once over they come under attack in the riots with those kind of ideologies of the nationalism they do not get any mercy and they 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 are not only beaten by the group of the people who attack them but also they get beaten up the the state coercive force or preventive force of the violence for example police that that actually happened and then examples are there you have 1992 uh, 93 riots in mumbai you have gujarat right you have 87 in uh, uh, you have in merit so and you have in bhagalpur so examples are a number of examples and that similar kind of situation was created for the sikh i'm not talking only for the muslims that does not mean i be, i am muslim then i talk only muslim you have to do a, you un understand that what actually justice system is needed as an individual how you have to be reflexive but it was more accessible for me to read those literature and go for the investigation that is why i am talking about the muslims so this kind of impunity greed and i think that is a very valuable addition to the uh, i mean violence literature and particularly talking openly about the impunity greed so it it, it, it is a very important addition and how it i mean the modern state how it continues with those practices so uh, i mean uh, with the traditional core and with the modern state and this violence goes on that actually the, that vicious circle continues but what actually i also investigated that i i try to see because i found literature on the violence particularly paul brass bill kinshan and uh, many other authors i mean uh, uh, many prominent political scientists from uh, france they have done research on the riots but what they examined that how the riots are patterned basically and looking at that is association with the politics what actually try to do that how the riots from 1901 what so about the reliable data was available i tried to put together from 1901 to assume 2009 and 2013 what is the actually the volume of riot but only the recorded riots and what is the geographic pattern of the riot because geography becomes very important to the sociality and how actually this speciality and sociality matches together to produce the violence that that actually uh, became important part of my investigation so what actually we say i mean still it is ongoing i am struggling for some data but what actually the pattern is emerging which actually i shared in the article that from 1901 to 1947 if you see the violence largely if you see the map in the book is located between the two uh i mean disturbed areas and the two disturbed areas are one side uh, punjab another side bengal and most of the riots are located on the indo gangetic plain most of the thing bengal and uh, punjab in between second the patterning what emerges and i was surprised most of the time 
we were told that and we are told also that the most of riots also took place where the princely states were there and particularly Nijam's state. And if you see, uh, you investigate, try to see the empirical data, you find a pattern where so the British territories were there, the riots were higher and where so the princely states were there including the Nijam's state and including the Jaipur state, you will find the less number of riots, only few riots. So, I mean, there is the instrumentalities which actually played by the British in this whole situation and how divide and rule and other things they brought. So, if you put on the geography, superimpose the maps, you clearly see a pattern that the British territories have more rights. And the colonial power obviously will create those things. There is no time to go back to the how they created this enmity between the Hindus and Muslims and how they continued and then divided. So that one part. Second, perhaps uh, Paul Bra uh, Wilkinson starts writing, I mean the beginning in his book on uh, violence, that in the first two decades of the independence, perhaps the India thought that it has come overcome the religious antagonism. Hmm. That, that actually the opening sentence says. So first from 1947-50s around to 70s, you will find that the, I mean, the violence declined. But we, in 1980s, because of the failure, many people say, and particularly those who are economic uh, determinists, they will say, because of the failure of the state to deliver equitable development to the all section of the society resulted in the hue and cry from the various sections and demand for the development. And the demand for the development also communalizes the society. What actually if you are silent at the periphery, then you are all right. And I tell you that uh, many, uh, I mean professors and many scholars will agree that if you are Indian society in the caste region system, and hierarchy uh, region system, if you want to be at periphery, you, sometimes you can be at peace. But if you demand the equality and development, then you are going to end into trouble. And then violence is going to follow you. And that actually question follows for Dalit and also the Muslims. And whensoever the, you demand for development, in Maharashtra they are going for the nowadays asking reservation. I said they are inviting riots. Hmm? That is the Marathas are asking, all right. But if Muslim, uh, I mean, uh, and if you start, uh, if the Muslim start asking, then there is going to be trouble and the possibility riots will follow. So, uh, what actually you see that till first two decades, you have some kind of calmness, but then later on, the lower section of the society start asserting, Mandal Commission comes, hmm, Gopal Singh Committee comes, and then many other issues who are the coming from the minority side, they also, uh, I mean, get communalized, particularly the demand for the Urdu as a language, hmm, a dominant language, and the minority status, status of the Aligarh Muslim University in early 1980s, and then Ram Mandir movement, Shabano case. Still, we are facing and we are a crucial juncture on the women's right in, uh, uh, I mean, for uh, Muslim women's right. So, that moment when it starts, you see that 1980s onward, there is a, a specific shift of the riots towards the south, southward. The southern states, which were not communalized, basically are getting fast communalized. And the whole communalism, I mean, not only that it is shifting southward, but engulfing the, I mean, country as a whole. Hmm? So if you look at those patterns, and this is very worrisome, that this kind of communalization will create large kind of violence uh, across the country. And you know what I said, that it is not only now religious or riots which we can stop, now it is also the nationalism and anti-nationalism, that also question has been combined with the Hindu-Muslim relationship. So it is a, I mean, 
we have to see that what kind of future unfolds before us but before it is too late for us those who are like minded i mean they can obviously come together do more research start writing start sensitizing people and particularly i have great hope from the civil society group and this is the platform because nowadays what happens we may be professors we may be holding positions but whether i can create yes syllabus or a course how to really harmonize the relationship it may not be possible because multiple question may be asked at that time hmm? so the spaces in academia also are shrinking and i think that it's very important the civil society groups take those things forward and whosoever is able to contribute they contribute and because we have to create a kind of equal and just society and we must strive for that hmm? justice for all what hmm, uh, i mean medion ang said that suppression of the oppressions hmm, and repressions we have to create a, a just and equal society and we have to see that everybody can enjoy the freedom they can enjoy the development and they can have a sense of safety and i think these kind of i mean a kind of uh, meetings and deliberations and important that how this kind of writings because these are the historical documents they are going to be read by not by our students but also large section of the population so we need to create more literature on that i am happy that i could find time and i i could get opportunity to share my thought with you thank you very much thank you thank you uh, uh, three people for your scholarly thoughts uh, my important question is of more of left wing extremism in this country where violence exist in this especially in the adivasi society so can violence justified on on the basis of a social justice um whether violence in the cause of justice is something one can justify especially in areas um, in, where adivasi populations are at large it's a question that we keep asking ourselves because we know that to fight injustice cannot always be easy and it cannot only happen at the level of argument or conversation that resistance through the use of arms sometimes is a choice that we don't have the luxury to make or not make you just end up fighting with those arms and that's something that we've seen throughout history now i don't know if we can settle this through a theoretical argument um i think on the other hand we can sort of put the other side of the argument also on the table if there is resistance through the use of arms to state violence or through capitalist violence what is the guarantee that that use of arms will not continue into peace time and that it will not entirely disempower a population this is a question that we can keep asking we also have other examples for example the zapatistas of uh, of mexico who used violence in strategic ways then beat a retreat uh try to build their community resources try to build a position of permanent resistance and decided that they will not carry arms beyond a certain point so maybe we should also look for ways of coming to this question from a diverse set of examples so that we are not just bogged by what we see in one particular historical context uh thank you for your uh, insights i have a doubt what is your thought on urban violence on rural uh, societies like say for example global warming or carbon emissions these are adversely affecting the livelihood of and those are mostly done by cities and urban societies they are adversely working uh, affecting rural societies how do you put this as violence or thanks for asking this uh, question i mean w- one thing is that how far you stretch the definition of the violence second thing obviously it is rooted in the structure in the capitalist mode of production because there are some dominant group of people who are creating those situation 
where there is a more disaster for the poorer section of the society so equity and that is where i mean sharing the carbon space sharing the responsibilities ha huh, for minimizing uh, uh i mean the emission of the carbon so all those things are actually going on and obviously it is rooted in the structure which is created by the capitalism hmm? so that obviously it comes into that it is a very silent but you are silently killing through the changes which actually you are able to do somewhere and it creates adverse effect for the somebody else yeah this is uh, my name is shivram prasad uh, uh, i thank mantam for giving an opportunity uh like uh, this is uh, a question for professor uh, uh, kalpana kanaviram i just wanted to know like uh, marital rape as you said it is a violence and suppose if you are uh, given an opportunity to uh, uh, to like uh, uh, give a case as an individual to put before the parliament and convince that it is a violence and how do you go about uh we are 1.3 billion people like you know uh so it, i according to me it is not a violence it is a right of a of a male since it is a social contract marriage is a social contract so like how do you defend it is a violence and uh, the next question is about mutilation of dead bodies as you said it is a, a prosecution can be initiated in the press it is it is coming uh, the officer uh, gives in the press stating that uh, like uh, giving the details of it so how an individual i can go to the icj and plead before it because uh, i i cannot uh, go against uh, you know i do not know what what is the procedure i am a layman and uh, how many cases uh, were uh, leveled before the icj of uh, uh, mutilation of uh, dead bodies and one of the soldier uh, got captivated he is in pakistan jail like uh, indian government is helpless is not making any efforts and we see a grave uh, uh, violence uh, is being subjected to a soldier so in, in like what precautions you know as a citizen i can take i'm concerned about uh, that particular soldier that is the, the other one and uh, about to to sir sir uh, you have said that uh, the muslims are living in uh, in india they are called as pakistanis and you know like you have a misconception uh, about this and then it's, it's a controversial thing being an indian and you also have come on record that indian indians forget everything you made such a statement it can be a defamatory also a defamation uh, case can be filed a sedition can also case also can be filed against you for making such a controversial statements and uh, about you said dongri tra traveling there the fellow as uh, quoted saying that you know are you uh, living in pakistan so being an indian you know like you must also know on merit uh, the, the jobs are being given the jobs are give, being given on merit it is not on based on the religion so you must be well aware of this so these these are the few questions you know i just i'm very curious to know because all the audience also wanted to know about the, uh, these uh, can you can you please Hello, sir. Just I'll take only two sentences. Yeah. Well, just let me say this: the meeting started beautifully. To speak about violence, slowly by the time the third speaker came, it the subject got diverted. That is general opinion. Thank you. Okay. So uh, let me uh, start uh, responding to all the questions, and then I will. give abdul and uh, geeta the opportunity to respond and i will uh, start uh, by addressing the observations of the uh, learned gentleman who spoke last uh, no meeting on violence no discussion on violence can start beautifully by definition the subject of this meeting is ugly it is troublesome it is controversial it is defamatory it is anti national there is no nice way of talking about violence 
And in talking about violence, we must move from how we understand it, which gives us the luxury of distance, to how we experience it, which is raw and disturbing. But I think if the general opinion, as you say, is that it was saying something else, and there was some disturbance, then it's a good thing. Because I don't think we can afford in this day and time to be complacent or comfortable with violence. The object is to force each of us, and ourselves included, ourselves included, importantly. Believe me, it has not been easy for either me or Geeta or Abdul to speak about violence or write about it. It has been a deeply disturbing exercise. Writing this book has been a painful exercise. Having it out and having it debated is even more painful. But it must be done, because we must move towards a shared understanding. So that is a rather long response to a brief evaluation of the meeting. I will quickly move to the uh, earlier speaker's question. However many billion people we are in this country, do I, am I right if I get the impression that if I say marital rape should be criminalized, all those million, all, all those billion men will be guilty of marital rape? So what is it that we are saying? There are so many billion people, how can we deal with so many billion cases? What is the implication of that? The implication of that is that every man in those billion people is a potential person who rapes his wife. I would hate to believe that. The question of marital rape is about consent. The contract is to enter into a marriage with a woman. And the marriage is consensual. The relationship is consensual. Cohabitation has to be consensual and not by force. Any cohabitation which takes place without the consent of one partner constitutes sexual assault. And there is it, it is deeply disturbing, but there is really no second argument about that. The fact is that parliamentarians also believe that men must not, that men must have the license to rape wives. And so they are not willing to legislate on this. But I'm not really surprised because I don't think socially, ethically, parliamentarians represent a progressive psyche in our country at this point of time. We even have a, the Supreme Court saying that if a woman asks her husband to come and live with her separately, she is committing cruelty on the husband. So talk about expanding definitions of violence. Now that's a wild expansion. The fact is that women live in patrilineal, patrilocal homes, and patrilineal, patrilocal homes historically, empirically. I have been a case counselor for 25 years. Empirically, patrilineal homes are abusive of women. All the women who come with, with experiences of violence have experiences of violence in patrilocal homes, where they are living in their husband's homes, with the complicity of the husband's family. So how can you suddenly turn that around? You can say that this divorce is not maintainable. Or you can say this divorce is maintainable on grounds of mutual incompatibility. But how can you say that her asking her husband to live apart in a conjugal home with her constitutes cruelty? So really, it comes back to our early point that we need to think through the question of violence very, very carefully and very, very thoughtfully. What are the implications of what we are trying to say? On the soldier, I think 
when soldiers enlist and when they enter the army, it is on the clear understanding that they will be called to war. It is on the clear understanding that they will be called to war, which might result in imprisonment or death. It is on that understanding that they enter the army. They do not enter the army on the guarantee of peace. But our argument is that war aside, I was not talking about war. Whatever the experience of war might be, once a person is dead, you shall not mutilate a dead body. That is an assault on the dignity of a person. And a person has dignity in death. The war with a person, the, the enemy abates with the death of the enemy. You cannot prolong enemy status in death. And I think that that is a very basic principle that we have somehow forgotten. Because this is not a war with any rules. I'm not really concerned about whether the other warring country abides by rules or not. I am concerned that my country, under any circumstances, must abide by accepted rules and conventions. As a citizen, that is the minimum requirement I place on my country. Because if you mimic the other, what are we quarreling about? There is really no difference. So I think that there are certain, these are difficult questions and difficult times that we are living through. But we really do need to ask these, if we don't ask difficult questions in difficult times, there is no use of asking questions at all. Peacetime doesn't need your questions. On defamation. It's not Shaban. None of us sitting here are worried about defamation. That is a risk we take in our everyday life of speaking and writing about the issues that we do. We must, I think, in our political lives and in our individual and professional lives, we have taught ourselves under very difficult circumstances to speak truth to power. And we will do that no matter what. There will be a defamation suit, so we will appear. And we know that the defamation suits, uh, we, we, we know the history of sedition. We know the history of defamation suits. So that's really not something that worries us. Very, very briefly, um, what are we afraid of? Let's ask ourselves simple, honest questions. What makes us anxious if someone says, I as a Muslim don't feel I am being treated as a coeval citizen, that my neighborhood is being called Pakistan? Why are we afraid to acknowledge that this might be the case in different parts of the country? So, in keeping with the argument that I made in my talk, I want to turn the question back to you, sir. What are you afraid of? And why are you bringing up issues of sedition and defamation? There is something deeply anxiety-ridden in your question. Your sense of the nation, if indeed you have one, or of this society, is not something that makes you feel located and harmonious with the world around you. You are not thinking deep questions about what all of this means to you, instead you seek to displace it on to somebody else. And I invite you to reflect on this and not come back to me with a reaction. Because I think that's very important. And this is, this is what I've been trying to say. We have to put ourselves in the dock. In caste society, everyone who's a non-Dalit is automatically in the dock. Likewise, everyone who's part of a majority religion, however they might experience their majority -ness, today has to stand and be counted as someone responsible for terrible things happening in this country. I'd like to remind you of what Mahatma Gandhi said while visiting Bihar after the Naukali riots. He said, if in a village there are five Hindus and 500 Muslims, on 500 Hindus and five Muslims, only after ensuring the safety of those five Muslims can those 500 Hindus look to their own safety. 
We all have our quarrels with Gandhi, but these are statements that we have to take very seriously today, because that is how this nation's democracy was built, and that is how we should keep nurturing it into the next generation. Secondly, on the subject of marital rape, the Indian context, let's face it, marriage is choiceless for most of us. We are forced to marry those who, belonging, those who belong to our same caste and class, those within degrees of non-prohibited kinship. How many of us have the luxury of choice? You are married into a home which you may not even want to go into, and if someone forces their sexual attention on you, it is clearly a violation. And there is no contract in today's modern democratic world which grants a man unequivocal authority over his wife. That is over, sir, for the last 150 years. That authority simply does not exist. It cannot be claimed. So let's be very clear that if we seek to sort of understand marital rape as a problem, we don't want to deal with it. As Kalpana said, take a hard look at yourself. What are you afraid of again? Thank you. Uh, what I say that, uh, look at as a researcher, as a, a person who investigates those things, we try to bring to you. Hmm? It's not actually the question that somebody is speaking of something, but what actually society is going through. Hmm? If somebody brings to the, that's what I said, that somebody brings that question of the Dalit, those questions are equally important. This is not actually trending. We are trending that what is going on in the society. And it's not that actually I'm telling a new something. You see in the newspapers also all those kind of situation. What actually we are telling, how as a civil society group, as an intellectual, we can confront those harsh questions, inculcate in ourselves, reflect on those things, and how best we can address them. That is the question. And that is the question what actually if you uh, read the research, you read the reporting of the newspapers, you happen to be on, on those lines, then you find those kind of disturbing questions. And that is where for all of us, it is not actually to, uh, I mean, hurt anybody. Hmm? That is not the intention. What actually the intention is, that how best we can be reflexive on those questions. And let us think about it. And this question is not about the Muslims in India, where some Hindus are in minority in Pakistan, same they are failing. As a citizens, as a global citizens, are in Bangladesh. So what we have to look at, that how we can deal with the difficult questions, how we can understand those problems, and do not leave any question unaddressed, but actually bring to the fora. If all of us as a conscious citizens do not talk those about issues, then who will talk? Tell me. It's not actually, uh, if we are not talking, we are not bringing before you, and we are not actually getting convinced of those difficult questions, who will actually talk about it? And how will you build a good nation? How the nation a composite nation will emerge. Because if there are grievances lying X, Y, Z, those grievances we need to address. And we have to make sure that we take everybody along. It's a long march of the nation building process. And we have to be take everybody, taking everybody along to make our beautiful country, beautiful society, a violence-free society. And what Gandhi just said, means and end we have both we have to look for and we have asked ourselves that what those difficult questions are there hmm? like Gyan Pandey has written uh, many others have written those things actually those questions and it is not to hurt anybody please do ask questions if you have anything hmm? this is not actually the fora where we hurt each other but this is the fora where we bring the questions up ask as a conscious citizens that if something is going on, are we hiding those things? We have to bring as a researcher forward. Hmm? So thank you very much.
good evening ma'am good evening sir so my question uh, is regard with regards to the acts that you spoke about like uh, you spoke about uh, atrocities against dalits you spoke about uh, uh, some acts like uh, women are facing problems so there are lot of cases where the women have you know misused them and as a person who knows victims of those cases how do you think our uh, society can avoid those things like for example uh, i would give you an example uh, there is a report which says that out of the 10000 approximately 10000 cases that are uh, you know filed for uh, dalit atrocities act nearly 80% of them are actually false only uh, i am talking about the verbal cases ma'am okay yeah this is a oh, okay fine i i'll take that back uh, but there is a lot of no uh, i i have read that actually and i oh. no can you just let him finish your question have you finished my question is how can we avoid that ma'am uh hello ma'am thank you for that uh, enlightening talk uh my question is more about the definition of violence uh so would any expression what would be the difference between any expression of hatred and violence um because i was having a, a slight difficulty understanding that would any expression of hatred constitute violence is there a difference so i have a, i have a question how come uh, a violence of a physical nature unites people uh, when there is a war cry as it is now you know suddenly all of us want to be part of the bandwagon or to be behind saying that we all want this kind of violence in a hindu muslim riot it is hindus and muslims it is not a dalit muslim riot or is a not a upper caste muslim riot what happens in the dynamics of violence that it suddenly unites a large section of people um i don't the, the young man there didn't finish his question but i think there's an anxiety there that i'd like to address um this is precisely part of the problem about atrocities um if you look at the number of cases filed under the atrocities act in any state maharashtra tamil nadu andhra pradesh and so on you will find that barely 1.6% even reaches the stage of prosecution largely because of the phenomenon of counter cases where if i go and file a case saying i've been verbally abused or my house has been destroyed or i am not allowed to uh, take my cow into the fields and i'm stopped from doing so because i'm dalit and if i make my public protest and i get beaten up then i go to file a case immediately a case is filed against me for theft for this for that and the other so this is the reality of the atrocities act in this country recently in different parts of india communities many of whom may not be economically very advanced when compared with dalits but who for years have enjoyed social dominance such as the marathas the patels the vanniyars the gounders in tamil nadu the kammakapu reddy cast in andhra pradesh any number of these socially dominant communities are not able to engage with the fact of dalit mobility and dalit assertion this is what i meant by impaired personhood why do you get angry if a dalit bursts a cracker in your neighborhood is your sense of self so fragile that you can't watch a dalit burst a cracker you feel affronted by it so clearly the question is atrocities is a caste hindu problem it's not a dalit problem let's face that atrocities is a caste hindu problem it's not a dalit problem so that being the case the onus is on us to ask what are these atrocities why do we carry them out and not immediately think of why is, is there a possibility the law could be misused in terms of the available information the misuse level is almost non existent as far as this law is concerned and there's been enough empirical work done on it and if there are counter reports they have been put out by interested parties that want the law repealed so as somebody who's worked with the atrocities act for several years i can tell you that i'll be happy to provide you with more information should you need any so that's something that is important about violence you know what uh, uh, and hatred it's a tough question um an unexpressed hateful thought is it the same as an expressed hateful thought um if a hateful thought if a hateful expression doesn't result in violence what does it mean it's very complex because sometimes the lines are very thin to draw but i can give you an historical example to help you think through this further and this goes back to world war 2 and anti-semitic sentiments in europe so um in many societies we make jokes about people who are not like us you know we have 
So I'm sorry to say Sardarji jokes, we have Madrasi jokes, we have many jokes. Now in Poland, for example, you had jokes about the Jewish people, right? Now when does that joke become a trigger for violence? This is a complicated question, you can't answer it easily. Is every instance of difference and prejudice a basis for violence? Is every instance of ignorant hatred a basis for violence? And this is where then you need to get empirical and historical, because acts of violence when carried out in public are always well-defined, contingent and contextual. And while the basis for that violence may not be very evident or clear, the very fact that someone harbors a hateful thought need not immediately mean that will result in violence. Because having a hateful thought and expressing it could also invite conversation. If you look at all the prayer meetings that Gandhi speaks at after Naukali, there is so much hatred expressed in those prayer meetings. He is not allowed to read the Quran, but it is expressed and he addresses that, no? So this is what I meant, you need context and you need protocols for talking about difference, for negotiating hatred. None of us is angelic, we all may harbour hatred. But how are we going to deal with hatred, with unease is the question. That brings me also, sir, to what you had raised. How is it that we are united in times of war and in times of riots and not otherwise? I don't know if you are only united in times of war and in times of violence. I think a lot has been written about mob psychology, a lot has been written about what triggers off a point of violence. And even in Gujarat 2002, you've had people stepping back and saying, I don't know why I did that. There has been the very celebrated case, I forget his name, Hiren, Hiren Pandya, who said that. So it's also something that has to do with the very physical nature of violence also. And anthropologists have taught us to look at violence as an act that can also bring people together in ways that have not been possible in, in, in other ways in that society. Now, I don't know if that is true in all instances, but it's certainly worth thinking about. But also, resistance brings people together. We know that as well. Resistance brings a lot of us together. I have sat on morchas with people with whom I disagree on many issues, but we are all there to protest one particular instance of injustice. So I think it's good to keep these counter-examples in mind so we don't get completely sort of paralyzed by the fact that violence, you know, is always something far more um, seductive than other acts. Also, just, just to add a small point to what Gita said, you know, uh, I don't even know that we are all united about the fact that we should go out to war. No, no, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, there is an expectation, but it, it, uh, my question then is, what is the basis for that expectation? So, I, I, th similarly also with riots, you know, there is, of course, a large mob which grows larger, and there are, uh, as Gita said, many, uh, you know, unexplainable things about why people come out in a mob, and then, after the violence is done, actually step back and find that they don't think it should have happened. You know, the celebrated case of Haren Pandya, who even then got killed after, uh, uh, you know, after he came out to the Krishna Year Commission. But uh, there are just that many people, like, I think the counter examples are very important. You know, who are the people and how many? And we have to start counting them as well, who don't want this to happen. And, and really that is where our struggle uh, for justice will begin, to keep the other count not to keep the count where you see large numbers. Uh, good evening, madam. Good evening, everyone here. Uh, it was a very good session uh, talking on violence. It is said that uh, the world suffers a lot not because of the violence of bad people, but because of the silence of good people. So my question is, uh, are uh, Indians at last being silent uh, uh, of the violence that is happening in the society and are we not using this freedom of speech that we all have, Indians? Because uh, I, I don't see many people talking about violence as you say, all said. Talking publicly is a different sense. My, uh, is, is, are Indians not using the freedom of speech that is there, uh, there in, uh, that is provided to them regarding violence and so and all are we being ignorant of what is being happening and we also see that media is uh, media does their uh, job in uh, promoting uh, violence because they spread awareness about it. But when it comes to the common people, they do not talk about it, nor they uh, 
debate about it. But events like month and do debate about it. I'm really proud to be here. My question is that uh, do people are uh, not talking about it openly? That my question is that. Yeah. Uh, Ajay, you want to add your question and then... One is I cannot thank Amita Desa enough for having triggered and reached out and said, let's host this together. Thanks a lot, Amita. In fact, uh, I'm so happy that we had this session. Uh, this is something that really needs to be talked about and talked about far too often as often as we can. And I take off from what that young man said. Uh, the thing that really troubles you is that the narrative through the nation is completely different than what it ought to be. The way media carries on its narrative, the way electronic channels and, uh, and uh, mainline newspapers carry on conversations and, and stories. This land is very different from what it is. Uh, uh, issues which should trouble are not put across, not talked of adequately, not talked of in most part of the media. And uh, they, they, they go into the periphery. The issues of gender or Dalit or Muslims are very, very real. In fact, what all the three of you have put across is very real. But they don't get talked about. And they need to be talked about much more. And that is what that young man was saying. And I think uh, we, need, we need to have much greater discourse on, on issues like this. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, one announcement uh, to all of you. Uh, continuation of this conversation will happen on Thursday when um, a noted feminist from America, uh, Zilla Eisenstein, will be coming and talking of patriarchy and from a uh, racist and a capitalist perspective and how it impacts us. I'm sure all of you will uh, enjoy it. We meet once again here coming Thursday, uh, 19th evening. Sorry, Wednesday, 19th evening. I'm very sorry. 19th evening. Well, um
I think, uh, yeah, otherwise we'll have to resort to violence. Yeah, well, actually, uh, there's not too much uh, by way of answer because I think Ajay answered your question already. Uh, but it's true, uh, you know, uh, I, the, the space for actually talking about this uh, openly um, and freely uh, is, in, is in fact shrinking. And that is the reason why we think that this kind of space for this discussion is extremely valuable and something that we recognize and we sincerely appreciate. Uh, but I also think that uh, free speech always comes uh, with its risks. And, um, you know, it, it's important to speak no matter what. Uh, and eventually we will uh, get heard. Yeah? Uh, on, on nature, of course, there is a larger debate on whether we are talking in anthropology, whether humans are totally disconnected from um, the animal and natural world and what the rights of various entities in the living world are. But that's larger debate, uh, which you can think through in terms of violence studies. Like we said, this is just a first step. We invite you to take the concerns here further, to ex extrapolate from it, and to expand what we have attempted here. And uh, as, uh, you know, as an act uh, closing uh, before, uh, you know, our friends from Manthan, um, you know, formally closed the event, uh, all of us have actually been uh, taken over by uh, some rather stunning news that has been welcomed by many uh, not understood by many, opposed by some. But I thought we could stop with uh, the legendary lines that make new meaning each time you hear them. Yes, how many years must one man have before he can hear people cry? How many deaths will it take till he knows that too many people have died? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind.